Welcome to Crazy Shit in Real Estate, a weekly podcast where I walk you through some of the wildest, most unbelievable stories you'll hear from the world of real estate. If you like real estate and you love crazy, this is the podcast for you. Hey, this is Crazy Shit in Real Estate. I'm Lee Brown, and this is my guest, Eric, over here. And if you're new to the show, I'm just so glad to have you, but you've missed three and a half years of good stuff. It's over on iTunes and the Crazy Shit in Real Estate podcast or Stitcher or wherever you get your podcast from. And then all of my regular Audible listeners, I love y'all, but now you can look at us if you want to and come on over to YouTube and have a look at the podcast on video. So we're glad to have you as we look at all the things in real estate that nobody ever talks about or shows you, but that's what Lee Brown is for. We are here to talk about all the things that you're interested in that HGTV is scared of. And so today I've got a young guest, yay for young guests, because we have Eric Boland today. Hey, Eric, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. Are you glad to be a young guest? Because, I mean, frankly, real estate is full of middle aged and old people. Well, if 34 is young, then I, I guess, uh, <laughs> then I guess most people are really old. Well, you know, the average age of a realtor is 56. And so I'm still below the average age and nobody knows how far because only Claire all knows, but you're way below the average. And so you should enjoy the shit out of that, frankly. Yeah, well, I got started pretty early, uh, kind of on accident, so. All right, so tell our people where you're located, how long you've been messing with real estate, any pertinent information before you dial into your story. Yeah, sure. Uh, let's see, I'm from Massachusetts originally. Then I moved to Texas. Now I'm uh, technically f- full-time in Puerto Rico, part-time in Texas. That sounds awesome. Yeah, so I just flew back to Texas yesterday, so it's a little dry and cold here. It's been in the 80s and nice for the last month. Here I am now, so that's that's where I'm located. All right, so you said you were young when you got into real estate. What does young, since you seem to think 34 is old and that's ridiculous, but anyway, well, how young is young and what, what dropped you into this space? Uh, let's see, I was 20, yeah, I'd be 24 because it was 10, technically 11 years ago now, 2009. Uh, so I was 24 years old. And I accidentally got into real estate because I wanted to buy a home. I couldn't qualify. And so I had a real estate agent help me out and everything. And I ended up buying a three family because- That was smart. Crazy for somehow you can't qualify for a single family, but once you have the rents from the other units, they qualify you. It's kind of really weird, but uh, that's how it worked out. And that's how I got my first property. And the plan was to sell it after about three years and be a normal person and buy a single family home. I was uh, working on my PhD at the time in economics, and I wanted to be a professor and be normal, I guess. That was my goal. And, uh, and then I realized- uh, Can't I'll do just that. Talk, yeah. So basically, my life changed, not, after, not from buying the property. Well, it was related to that. It was actually when I got paid my rent. I was watching TV, and somebody knocked on my door. And it was one of my tenants there to pay me the rent. And I lived in a really bad neighborhood at the time. So eight or nine you o'clock mean at challenge, night. Challenged neighborhood. It was called challenged. Challenged. Yeah. Well, it's still challenged. So, um, <laughs> and uh, people don't walk around at night in that neighborhood, right? Like you, you go because straight they to gotta, They got to go to bed because they got to go to work in the morning, right? Yeah, that's exactly. That's exactly why. So anyway, he paid me the rent. He paid me cash. I wrote him a receipt. I put the money down on the table. He paid cash because I think he was a drug dealer. And entrepreneur, that's yep. just an entrepreneur. Hey, he didn't have to work, right? So, but anyway, so and I and just my I realized I'm like, wow, money knocked on my door tonight. My wheels grinding. I just realized that's what I'm going to do. I want money to come to me, just like that. You know, up to that point, I I was a student, but I was in the army. I was a reservist in the army, and, and you know, I did a lot of odd jobs and stuff. So I worked really hard up to that point. And this was like three weeks worth of pay for doing almost nothing. So right. I'm like, this, then my life changed. And I'm like, this is what I'm doing. So when you were doing your PhD, were you macro or micro? I think I know the answer. I was focused on macro. I was actually, I really liked um, uh, exchange rate economics and international (gasps) uh, monetary policy. You understand currency? Yeah, I do. Yes. Oh my gosh. I'm always talking about the fluctuations in the currency rate and arbitrage and currency is like where the big money is. Nobody understands it. So can we have a conversation sometime and talk about currency arbitrage? Yeah, sure. I'd love to. That was uh, what, what I was researching, actually, when I was... Uh, it's so freaking fascinating. And right now, Brexit's happening. It's going to be a whole new world. I'm so excited. Yeah. Well, we'll have to set up another call. 
So I'm so excited. I'm always glad to meet another nerd. So anyway, back to money knocked on my door. By the way, thanks for serving in the reserves. My son's going to sign up when he's 17 because he's a smart kid who's figured out that by 37, he'll have a pension. So mm -hmm. if you stayed in the reserves, you're almost at pension level. That's money knocking on your door too for service. But anyway, so you bought a triplex. Did you realize then that that's what everybody should be doing at their first house is not just buying a four, two and a half, two car garage, you should buying multifamily? Yeah, it took me a couple of years to, to start piecing everything together. It was, it's been a really long journey. Now I look back and I, I remember I became a real estate agent in 2011 and the first property that I listed, uh, I don't know, I sold it for three or $400,000 and a really young couple, like late twenties working regular jobs. I think the woman was pregnant and they bought this thing. And I'm like, man, they are buying like a chain and like around their neck that's going to hold them down for the next 20 years. And I felt really bad actually selling it to them. But obviously I'm representing the seller and I can't say anything about that, but I'm like, man, this is a terrible financial move for them. But it's better than paying rent. I mean, there's that. Yeah, I guess, but you could pay you a lot. You were looking at it. Your perspective has was forever changed by owning a triplex. Yes. I, I don't own, I don't live in a multifamily anymore. I live in my own you know, good sized house now, but all the rent from my other properties pay for it. So I don't really have to work for this. Uh, and I realized no, no, you realize work for it. You work for it. You work for it. You have leveraged up to it and you might have wake up money, but you've leveraged to it. So don't, don't discount that a whole lot there, Eric. So yeah. talk to me about what you did next. And so you started to leverage yourself up. How did you decide to scale and what was the scariest moment for you in that process? Because it's it's definitely nerve wracking to take on tenants and to take yeah. on debt and to have to rely on them following the rules. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it is extremely difficult too because it was Massachusetts, which is very tenant friendly. So you have to be really on top of what you're doing. That place is a wreck. I wouldn't own investment property in Massachusetts. Yeah, well, so but y'all should just not me. So the uh, well, to, on a side note about that. Anywhere that there's a lot of government interference in the market creates opportunity for people who really know what they're doing and can kind of use that to their advantage because most people don't. They buy in, they have problems, that creates problems that you can solve, which creates value. You can make that value and earn that money. So uh, it's people make a lot of money in California and Massachusetts. I just, as an outsider, I wouldn't go in. But if you're an insider and you understand it, it's a great place to be. Right. You've seen uh, the movie Pacific Heights, right? I have not actually, no. I mean, it came out before you were born, but it's a fantastic movie. And frankly, it's probably the reason a lot of people don't buy investment properties because the tenant knew the laws better than the homeowners, mm -hmm. which that happens a lot if you're especially in a government regulated state. But when you're in a, a less regulated state, it's a more fair environment. And so you've landed in one of the most fair property rights states we have in Texas. And mm -hmm. I'm curious to know what it's like in Puerto Rico. And I presume you buy and sell there as well. I do not. I just live there for tax benefits. So I, uh, I actually, I don't own anything. I rent an apartment there and um, just started last year because it's a tax haven. You don't have to pay federal income taxes if you live there more than six months out of the year. So you so, live there six months in a day? Yeah, six months in a day, you don't pay federal income taxes. So it's, it's pretty good. You go to a tropical paradise, I guess, so, so it's called. I mean, it's got its own issues, but uh, you go there for half the year and don't pay income taxes. It's kind of win-win. So do you primarily buy properties in Texas or do you have other states that are good targets for you? Yeah. So where I primarily buy for, so I, I got a couple different strategies that I follow. Small properties, I buy mostly in Massachusetts because I know the market and I have a system there that works really well for me. If I were taking on larger projects, often they're in Texas. We've got two apartment complexes in Texas, but I also in the process of working with people in different states. So I kind of leverage other people now. I'm at that point in my just life where I want to find partners who are local to where we're going. And so there's, sure. a, there's several different markets that I have people that we're, we're working on, but I don't own anything in those markets right now for different things like uh, land development or just, I like, I like Tennessee. Uh, it's really good. Atlanta is really good. North Carolina. I'm trying to build out some people there. So I'm, I'm trying to be in different markets. We got it going on North Carolina. It's a high growth state. We just got to keep our legislators in line. That's all. Oh yeah, absolutely. All right. So what's the advice that you give to people when they say, man, I should have done what Eric did and got started young. And look, he's scaling up and buying properties, buying multifamily developing. How do you tell people to get started and what the first steps are? Yeah. So the first thing that I think is the most important thing is to understand why you're doing it, what you're trying to do. Because in real estate, as you probably know, you talk to hundreds of people, 
there's all different ways to be in real estate. There's hundreds, thousands of niches to be in. Uh, you you got to find one that works for you that you like, and then you got to focus on it. Biggest problems I see with people are they, they kind of do one thing for a little bit, then they do another thing for a little bit, and then they kind of bounce around and never really grow. They never even, sometimes never even get started. So maybe they're doing single family, then their house flips, then multifamily, then mobile homes, whatever, and they just keep changing versus just taking six or nine months and just really focusing on one thing. So find a niche. I would say you can be successful in any niche, just not in every niche. So you just got to find it and focus. And it's just going to line up with your goals, what you're trying to accomplish. So if you want to build a business and you want to build, uh, have a team and you want to grow something, you might go into something more active, like maybe house flipping or wholesaling, things like that. If you want to be more passive and work another job, you might go into rental property or multifamily. So what's your goal? Is it like 10,000 doors? Do you want to buy and hold forever? Do you like to flip? What's your goal? My goal is lifestyle based. So I'm not focused on the specific number of units or money. I have enough money right now. I don't have to work. So it's just earning more money in a way that I like to, and in a way that lets me keep my lifestyle. So I got to, I turn down opportunities all the time that make a lot of money just because I know it's going to take too much of my time. So where do you spend your time right now? Is it primarily an acquisition or is it keeping up the current properties that you have? What are you looking for right now? What am I looking for? So I'm in the process of trying to sell off a couple of my smaller stuff and I'm turning them into like monopoly, you turn them in, sell your greenhouses and buy the red houses. I have this theory that you can only manage like a certain number of properties at a time, like 10 or 15, like actual assets. And so my goal is I'm trying to sell off some two and three unit stuff to turn those into 20 unit buildings and then still just maintain 10 or 15 actual assets and just kind of keep doing that. So I presume that you're using 1031 tax-free exchange when you are changing properties out. So I, last year I didn't do any 1031s and I sold them because the return, the, uh, the total, the total taxable income was low enough. I'm putting about a hundred thousand dollars into a, a solo 401ks between me and my wife. So 50 K on each. And that's actually offsetting most of our taxes. Very so, nice. So you don't always need to do a 1031 if you can offset enough of the taxes that you don't, you don't have to do it. And then we just still have access to that capital in other ways. So how many units do you own at this point or what's your, in 11 years, how fast have you grown your empire, Eric? Yeah. So I got two different portfolios and I count them differently. I got ones that I own myself and that's about just under 50 units in Massachusetts. And then I've got our apartment complexes that I have partners on. Of course, we have passive investors and other active investors on it. And that's about 450 units of apartment complexes. Uh, So I I separate them because owning 100% of 50 units is a lot more than owning like a few percent of 400 something units. They're both valuable. They're both good, but they're obviously very different. So what are you going to, if you have enough money not to work and you're picking and choosing your opportunities, what gets you excited about real estate and investing right now? Uh, what really gets me excited is talking about real estate. Yeah. Um, and it just started a couple of years ago. I spoke at an event and like three months after the event, somebody like cyber stalked me. I like to say that they're being really nice, but they found my home address and they sent me a Christmas card. It was, it was a oh. husband and wife. And they just said, Hey, that talk changed our lives. We printed out something and we keep it on our board, on our refrigerator. And we look at it every day and you changed our lives. And I'm like, I'm like, wow, that's really like fulfilling. And so, you know, I've started to kind of grow that out more because I did struggle with what motivates me because I'm not a money motivated person. Right. You know, I'm more about travel and experience and I, and I realized that gets me excited. So I started building out, growing my blog and my website and I speak and I run events and I do some coaching and stuff. So that really gets me excited. All right. So why should somebody reach out to you? And then we'll, we'll tell them how and then about why. Besides why? the fact that you enjoy it. Why? What are you going to provide this different? What am I going to provide this different other than being real um, and authentic, which is one of the big problems in the real estate education space. And so I'm not out there trying to sell product to people who don't need it. And I turned down most people who try to buy anything from me. I, I tell them no, which is kind of really weird about me because I don't need the money and I don't care to, to earn it. And I don't want problems and I don't want to work with people who are going to create right. problems for me. So uh, that's what's different about me. And so just the authenticity, that's the number one feedback I get from people. So that's why if you want, want to talk to a real person, that's why. And of course, you can look up, you know, Eric Bowen and or you go to idealrei.com. To what.com? Idealrei.com. Look, see, so you were talking millennial speed and not Gen X and boomer speed. Ideal 
R E I. R E I. Ideal real estate investing.com. Yeah. All right. So, Eric, you'll have all of your contact information in the show notes for this episode. Guys, look him up. See if you can figure out why he's been so much more successful than you have in just a few short years and find some things you can emulate and get inspired by because. There's always places to grow and change in real estate and can't go backwards, but you can always go forwards. Eric, thank you for coming on the show and yes. we wish you all the best. I look forward to seeing you at a real estate event in the future. Thanks for having me. All right, guys, hit me up if you want to show up on an episode of the podcast in the future. Hit subscribe, give me five stars. I'm at Lee Brown on the political dumpster fire known as Twitter, or you can hit in the comments here, Facebook, Instagram, or in iTunes and otherwise subscribe because I'll see you next time. If you are listening to this episode and you need to tell us something about your crazy life in or around real estate, then tweet me at Lee Brown or reach me on any of the social networks. That's if you're a broker, realtor, investor, inspector, lender, or just a regular normal human being who happens to have dealt in real estate. Subscribe for more episodes. And as always, we are thrilled that you joined us for some crazy shit in real estate. See you next time.